2. Jesus prophesied that Jesus would die, or excuse me, that Peter would die a violent death. Many say he was crucified upside down. And John lived the longest of the three, and he received the revelation, and he was banished to an island. But on this occasion, they climbed the mountain together, and in verse 2, the Bible says that Jesus was transfigured before them. What does that word mean? I find it to be a very interesting word. It comes from a word metamorph. The word meta means to change, and the word morph means another form. So what the word means is that Jesus was changed into another form. And that word appears a couple of other places in the New Testament, and we'll notice that before we close. But uh, I want you to notice how he was changed into another form. And there, this is recorded three times in three different Gospels. The, the three, what we call the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, what you're going to find is that every one of them describes that change a little bit differently. Matthew says that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Have you ever tried to go out in the middle of the day and just stare at the sun? I don't recommend it. It can damage your eyes if you look at it too long. But that's the way Matthew described it. Can you imagine looking up at Christ when you wake up like these three disciples and you're looking at something as bright as the sun? Mark says his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And Luke's account, he says... And he's the only one that tells us what Jesus was doing on the mountain, by the way. Luke says he was praying. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. You, like, you know what it's like when you go out on a very dark night, and all of a sudden, there's a huge flash of lightning in the sky, and you can see for miles for just a second with that flash of lightning. Well, no wonder these men were afraid when they looked upon Jesus and saw such uh, a flash. That's what Jesus looked like to them. In verse 3, they were not alone with Jesus anymore. The Bible says that there were two other visitors there. In fact, it says there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now that's kind of interesting. You've got three witnesses on the earth, Peter, James, and John. Now you've got three witnesses from the heavenly realm, Jesus, who's now in a glorified state, and you've got Moses and Elijah. There's a verse in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 19 and 5, that says that every matter has to be established between two or three witnesses. And so you've got three witnesses on earth, and you've got three from the heavenly realm on this occasion. Now, Moses and Elijah had been dead for a long, long time, hadn't they? Moses, you remember, he died on a mountain called Mount Nebo, and that's recorded in the latter part of Deuteronomy. And the Bible says that God buried Moses. There was nobody else there. They never found his grave, but God buried him. And, uh, you know, Moses was the type of Christ. He was the prophet of the old law and a type of the mediator of Jesus Christ. The Bible later would say that God would raise up a prophet like Moses, and him shall you hear in all things. And that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. Elijah was a representative of the prophets. And so you've got the representative of the prophets and the representative of the old law. And before it's over, Jesus says, you need to be listening to Jesus Christ, my son. No longer listen to the old law. No longer listen just to the prophets. He said, hear ye him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Well, what a scene that was. The mediator of the old covenant in a conversation with the mediator of the new covenant or the New Testament. And Elijah is there and he's representing the prophets. It's, it's fascinating to me. But go, go uh, continue on with me in Matthew 17. Look at verse 4. The Bible says that Peter said, well, now, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's build one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. You know, some think that what Peter was doing here was he was putting all three of these men on the same plane. 
on the same plane. And, and God made it clear, a voice spoke and said, no, you need to hear Jesus Christ. And that he wanted to sustain the situation for a while. Have you ever wondered what they were talking about? Moses and Elijah. Wouldn't that be interesting to know if we could find something in the Bible that, tell, that would tell us? It says that Jesus was talking with Moses and Elijah. I wonder what they were talking about. That would be interesting if we could eavesdrop on the conversation. With them. Well, did you know that you can? <laughs> Luke's account tells us what they were talking about. Go with me over to Luke chapter 9 and verse uh, 31 and listen to what they were talking about. It says... They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring about at Jerusalem. That's what they were talking about. I think one translation may use the word, they talked about his exodus, which he was about to bring about in Jerusalem. That's in Luke 9 and 31. What a conference. They're talking about his exodus. Now Moses was there as the children of Israel made their great exodus out of Egypt. But he couldn't bring about the end result of what God was really after. So Moses, who was involved in the exodus out of Egypt, is talking to Jesus about his exodus, about his leaving the world and somehow getting back to the Father. What a conference that was that day that they're talking about all of this. Moses and all the prophets and Elijah, they couldn't bring about that great exodus that God wanted, getting man to exit out of sin and the exodus out of this world back to the Father in heaven. Well, the Bible says in Matthew 17 and 5 that a, brown, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and God announced, this is my son. You know, God did that one other time in the life of Jesus, didn't he? You remember when it was? What was the other time where God announced Jesus as his son? That's right, at his baptism. And I had a thought as I was studying this. I thought, I wonder if, if Jesus... If God announces uh, that we're his sons and his daughters at our baptism, it's just a thought. Or that's what he acknowledges it. This is my son. It was at the baptism of Jesus that God acknowledged this is my son. I wonder if not at our baptism that that is a thought we can have, that God is acknowledging us as his sons and as his daughters. Well, as we continue to think about this, it's kind of interesting that a cloud overshadowed them. I did a little research on clouds, and it's kind of interesting when you run through the Bible and study clouds. The, the cloud was a symbol of divine presence throughout the Old Testament. And the fact that a cloud overshadowed them, I think, is one of the reasons maybe why they were so afraid, Peter, James, and John. In Exodus 14, 19 through 25, you might remember there was a pillar of cloud that... Uh, moved from in front of the children of Israel when Egypt was pursuing them in the sea and moved behind them and separated them throughout the night. It was a cloud. It was a symbol of God's presence. At Mount Sinai, when Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments, there was thundering and there was lightning and there's also a thick cloud that came down on the mountain, a symbol of God's, uh, of God's presence. We find over there in Exodus 33, Whenever they made the tabernacle a tent of meeting, the Bible says in verse 9, Moses went into the tent and then a pillar of cloud would come down on top of that and they would know God was present. And finally, when they made the tabernacle in the Old Testament, they were traveling through the uh, wilderness. The Bible says a cloud would, would be right there over the tabernacle. And whenever it was time to move, that cloud would start moving and then they would know it's time to pack up and start following that cloud and a pillar of fire by night. So it's pretty interesting. God's presence, it symbolized his presence. And here a cloud overshadowed them. They knew they were in God's presence. They fell out on their face. They were scared to death. And Jesus came up and touched them and said, don't be afraid. He said that more than once, didn't he? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, I think it's interesting their reaction that they fell down afraid. But Jesus tells them going down the mountain in Mark 9, he says, now don't you tell anybody what you've seen. Can you imagine how hard that was to keep that in? I mean, wouldn't you want to go down, boy, guys, you, you won't believe what we just saw. Because what happened was, it's almost like what was inside Jesus, his deity, 
was manifested outwardly in front of them. His deity, his glory. They could see his glory. Peter would later write, we have seen his glory. And Peter later revealed the secret. He said, don't you tell a soul about this until after I'm resurrected from the dead. And when you get over into Peter's writings, he says, we saw him on the mountain. We beheld his glory. So after the resurrection, Peter revealed it to, uh, to everyone. Read 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. I won't read it now for the sake of time. But 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. Peter reveals everything. We were with him on the mountain, he said. We, we beheld his glory. And what happened was Jesus, this is interesting to me. Jesus here, I think, was changed into who he really was on the mountain of transfiguration. We oftentimes think, well, he was changed into another form, but really he was revealing who he was. The real miracle, one person said, and I like this, the real miracle was not what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. The real miracle was what happened when Jesus left heaven and came to earth and hid himself in human flesh. You see what I'm saying? That was the real miracle. Uh, Philippians talks about that in detail. And if you want to turn over there and read it sometime, second, or Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul wrote about the change and all the, the steps of the change that Jesus went through in order to become flesh. So the real thing was Jesus was hiding in flesh, we might say. God was, uh, was in the flesh. And on the Mount, Tre uh, Mount of Transfiguration, he let them see who he really was. He kind of pulled back the veil and they beheld his glory. So the real miracle was that his essence was hidden for so many years. That's kind of an interesting thought to me. Well, let me make a couple of applications before we have the song of invitation. What was the purpose of this journey up the mountain? What was the purpose and what can we gain from it today? Well, one purpose was to forever settle in the hearts of these three men who Jesus was, that he was indeed the Son of God. And we need to be uh, firm on that as well. The other thing that I think we can gain from this is God wants a change in us. I mentioned the word there is metamorph, metamorphe, which means to change into another form. And that word occurs a couple of other times in the New Testament. One time is found in Romans 12 and 2, where it says, be not... Uh, conform to this world, but be, here's the word, metamorph, transformed by the renewing of your mind. So just like Jesus was changed into another form, he says, I want you to be transformed. How do you do it? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove it as that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The, the word uh, appears at least one more time in 2 Corinthians 3. I'll turn there real quickly. It's pretty interesting if you want to look at it. 2 Corinthians 3, it's the, uh, the same word that uh, occurs again. And on that occasion, Paul the Apostle is writing. He talks about the face of, face of uh, Moses. His face was shining and uh, faded though it was. And he would put a veil over his face so that they could not see the shining face, right? No. He did not put a veil over his face so they couldn't see his face shining. I thought that for years. He put a veil over his face so they would not see his face fading. And if you read carefully in the Old Testament as well as 2 Corinthians, you'll see that is true. Fading though it was, he would put the veil. He'd let them see his face shining. But the veil was put over his face so they wouldn't see it fading away. And that became an illustration. Paul said that the Jews still have a veil on their hearts. When they read the Old Covenant, they can't see that it's supposed to be fading away, you see. Because they've got the same kind of veil, like Moses had over his face. Well, here's the word metamorph in verse 18. We all, with unveiled faces, all reflect, reflect the Lord's glory and are being, here's your word, transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes by the Lord or from the Lord who is the Spirit. I like it that he says that we're being transformed. Not that we are transformed. It's a process. And it takes time. And we have to be patient with one another. Because we're all being transformed. We're all being changed into another form. 
by the Spirit of our God. I want to conclude our thoughts this morning that by making one other observation, and that is, what if Jesus had gone ahead and, and performed this miracle, if you want to call it that, when he was growing up in Nazareth? Or when he was standing before Pilate, what if his face suddenly became like the sun and all of a sudden they realized this is, this is God? He wouldn't have had to go to the cross, would he? So why didn't he go ahead and do that? Because he could have avoided that. That's the point. It could have been avoided, and that was not God's plan. And so he chose to reveal that to three men, Peter, James, and John, up on a mountain all by themselves, and warned them, don't you tell a soul until I'm resurrected. I hope that study has been helpful to you. Uh, we want to go ahead and have the hymn of invitation. I think everyone here uh, that's at an age, appropriate age, knows the gospel. Jesus said he that believes and is baptized will be saved. We'll go ahead and stand together and sing number 82 in the page book.